Kelly Price gives an emotional testimony about her 30-year career. And so I just wanted to jump on. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Um, I just wanted to jump on and uh, share this. Hey, everybody, share um, this news with you. This week, 30 years ago, I got a call that changed my life. I got a call to, um, at the last minute, in fact, um, go and uh, meet at Madison Square Garden for a gig. I was not told who the gig was with. It was a last minute call, simply was just asked, can you be at the garden at three o'clock? And if so, we're all black. So I said, yes. Um, so fast forward, get to the garden. Rehearsal starts at three o'clock. We're in a room um, rehearsing. It's an ensemble. It was uh, the Daryl Douglas ensemble, actually. Uh, Daryl is now deceased. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Um, but he called and we came and an 18 year old Kelly Price showed up at Madison Square Garden, went into this rehearsal room with my other friends who sang with him. And we start rehearsing George Michael songs. We were going on with George Michael. That was my first paid performance. Um, and that was 30 years ago this week. And so um, rest in peace, George Michael. It's where I got my start, my very first gig. And George being under the Sony umbrella, a very talented young woman from Long Island um, who was a new artist, uh, was nominated for several Grammys, I believe that year, and also had to perform. And she wanted a gospel group behind her for that performance. And having just done George Michael, we got that call. So my second engagement was with the incredible, the talented, the beautiful Mariah Carey. Thank you, Mariah Carey. I spent 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 92, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, yeah, up through 1996, um, touring, recording, um, performing with that um it, she is a phenomenon i'm trying to think of the right words and there's really nothing i can i think come up with that hasn't been used to describe her gift and her talent um but everything that anybody has ever said amazing about her um that's all embodied in that incredible woman um thank you mariah carey um as the story goes a pregnant 18 year old kelly price i didn't know i was pregnant when i did the George Michael gig. I found out I was pregnant before the Mariah Carey gig. So a pregnant 18 year old Kelly Price shows up for the Grammy rehearsal. And we were there uh, in the rehearsal hall for hours. And um, I was sick. I had a horrible morning sickness. And so when they broke the choir, um, I did not go to eat. The smell of food for probably like the first four or five months just made me want to cough up everything. And so, I did not go on a break to eat with the rest of the group. Instead, I sat at the piano with my friend Daryl, started singing. Um, <sighs> I'm trying not to be emotional, y'all. Okay. And Mariah walked in. She walked in with Randy Hoffman, with Tommy Mottola, and with Trey Lorenz. Hey, Trey. Um, and so by the time I looked up and realized that she'd walked in the room, I jumped up from the piano and walked away from it because my intention was not to try and be seen or heard that day. And uh, like I said, she wasn't there. She showed up while uh, I was singing at the piano with Daryl. And she sent Trey over to me. Uh, unbeknownst to me then, I now know, she sent Trey to me um, and said, see if you can get that girl to sing again. Find out who she is. And so... I started singing, um, again, obviously. I mean, that's the easiest thing to do in the world for me and has been. Um, and she snuck over and she came and she said hello. And um, I really felt weird because again, I'm there with a group and I am not, tr that was not the intention. That was not the intention. Um, so we have 
a brief conversation. I'm basically just telling her, yo, oh my God, I love you, I love you. Um, and trying to stay professional and not fan out. Um, <laughs> and it ended up that at the end of rehearsal that day, uh, Tommy Matola, hey Tommy, how are you? Thank you, sir. Um, Tommy Matola approached and introduced himself and uh, he says, you're a star. And I'm like, <laughs> Okay, y'all gotta remember, I'm fresh out of Edgemere Projects at 18 years old. Um, big mouth, don't, don't have a whole lot of tact. Um, and I'm just like, okay, yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, he said, what, what do you think about, would you wanna come work for Mariah? And I'm like, is he kidding? Is he kidding? And uh, he wasn't, he wasn't. Um, <laughs> so, Again, me not having a whole lot of tact. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll do it, but I don't go anywhere without my sister, so you're gonna have to hire the both of us. I was stupid, right? But no, th that's the way we rolled. Um, <laughs> so he was like, that's fine. I was like, first of all, the way we sound together, I'm telling you, like, that would be the sound. So um, <sighs> he hired us, he hired us. My next engagement with Mariah Carey was then at the now, um, record-breaking and uh, phenomenal MTV Unplugged. That was a series back in the day for those of you who were not born in the early 90s and perhaps have never heard of what MTV Unplugged was. It was an incredible show. They should absolutely bring it back. Um, performed at her now like legendary MTV Unplugged performance. So again, a very Kelly, very pregnant 18-year-old Kelly Price took the stage for the first time officially as a Mariah Carey background singer. Um, there, there was a group there as well. Um, and it was all of my friends from the Daryl Douglas Ensemble, but that was my first time working, actually having been hired, hired directly um, by Mariah. And so um, that changed the trajectory of my life. Absolutely changed the trajectory of my life. This pregnant 18 year old, a uh, girl who come from a broken home, um, amazing faith because my faith in God was, you know, my grandparents, they did an incredible job of instilling um, a seed of righteousness. I feel like I can't get away from it um, in all of their children and all of their grandchildren. Um, my, I'm, my life has never been the same since that day. That was 30 years ago and here I am. And I'm so grateful because I almost wasn't here. But here I am, 30 years later, and um, I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful. I took my first trip overseas. I mean, other than Canada, I'm a New Yorker, so I've been to Canada. But my first trip overseas with Mariah at six months pregnant, we went to London to perform for Top of the Pops. Prior to that, I went in and did a session with Mariah for Trey Lorenz's album. Sang on Trey's album, Backgrounds. Took my first trip with Mariah in June of 1992 to London to perform. She had a press run, performed for Top of the Pops. Um, and life has never, ever been the same since then. Um, 48 years old I am now, that's a long time, right? Um, 30, so 30 years later, here I sit. Um, I exclusively toured with Mariah from 92 until 96, and in 1996, um, had the opportunity, the story is too long, I will say that uh, to meet Puff Daddy, but believe it or not, that introduction was facilitated by Stevie J, Stephen Aaron Jordan. Um, I'd come to the studio to meet him to discuss, honestly, I just wanted to um, start placing songs that I had been written and move into another arena. Um, even if it wasn't to be an artist, even though I felt like I wanted to be, um, if it wasn't to be an artist, at least to be able to write music and to produce and that kind of thing. And so went to daddy's house to meet with Stevie and almost in identical fashion, we got to talk and got to talking about church, got to, cause he's a PK too. For those of you who know him, you know that he is a preacher's kid. Um, so he started playing this song by Vanessa Bell Armstrong, Faith That Has, Faith That Can Conquer Anything. I actually recorded that on my Grace Project last year. And I started to sing Faith. And Puffy walked in the room while I was singing. Um, and 
almost identical. When I real, I, I didn't realize that he was there. Um, my back was to him and my eyes was closed. My eyes were closed. I was completely engulfed um, in the song. Finished the song. Um, Puffy walked back in the room and says, hi, how are you? I'm Puffy. I'm like, hey, yeah, I know who you are. Hi, nice to meet you. He asked Stevie to step out of the room for a second. So Stevie stepped out of the room. Hi, guys. Um, I'm caught up and I'm trying not to cry. Um, and Stevie came back in. He asked Stevie to get me to sing again so he could hear more of me. Um, and so Stevie did that. Came in, started playing something else. And I started singing. And while I was singing this time, Puffy walked in the room so that I could see him <sighs> while I was singing. And uh, he shook my hand and he said, I've never heard anyone sound like that before. And in my mind, the Edgemere Project chick with not a lot of tact, <laughs> um, but a little bit more sense. One well, more tact than I had at 18 and, and more sense um, in my mind. I'm saying, yeah, right. He hears people sing all the time. Like, really? Duh. But whatever. Okay. He's spitting producer game. He's spitting record company executive game. By this time, I had been in the business since 92. It was 1996. Kind of knew the lingo. Um, he said, that's great. You sing? I said, he's obviously he's saying, I said, yeah. He says, well, do you write? I said, yeah, of course I write. So uh, he says, follow me. He walked. Um, so, okay. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I thank everybody along the way. So Stevie... Thank you so much. I appreciate you. You are etched in the history of Kelly Price forever, before a friend of mine, because that moment was facilitated through you. So thank you for being obedient to God and invite me to the studio that day, because again, it was another life-changing moment for me, guys. Okay, so uh, Puffy tells me to walk in the room, to follow him to this room. So we go into um, a session that was actually happen happening um, at that time, and it was a young group, young guy group, and so he interrupted the session, um, called the guys out of the booth and said to the engineer, um, throw on a beat for me. And so uh, I'm, I'm trying to read you guys. I'm trying to read you guys uh, comments. I got to keep telling the story or else I'm going to get caught up. Um, he says to the engineer uh, here, I want you to throw on a beat. And so he looks at me. He says, so you say you're right. I said, yeah, all right. So he said, OK. Told the engineer, throw the beat on, raw beat. No, not like barely any chords. It's mostly, y'all know it, it's hip hop. It's bad boy. It's the 90s. So it's very rhythmic, not a lot of music. So I said, okay. I grabbed a pen and a piece of paper off of the desk in the control room. And I started scribbling some stuff. And Puffy snatched the pen out of my hand and snatched the pad out of my hand and said, no, you a writer, write. My whole insides were shaking. All of my insides were shaking. Um, <laughs> so I honestly, I couldn't tell you what I sang that day. I couldn't tell you what I said. I started any word that came to my head. I sang the word and just put a little stank on it. I was like, maybe he won't be able to tell that I'm really just trying to, I like, because I don't consider myself a freestyler. I can ad lib freestyle very, very well. Um, but he tried me that day. Um, and I, I just, I'm grateful that I didn't allow myself to be intimidated in the moment and say, no, I need the pen and the piece of paper. He challenged me by taking the pen and the paper and I gave him what I had. And it was the best that I could give on the spur of, of a moment. Um, and I tried to make it sound as pretty as I possibly could. And uh, apparently he was impressed. I thought I was a hot mess, but uh, he was impressed. And he was like, I really would like to you know, look into working with you some more. And I'm like, yeah, okay, sure, no problem. So we exchanged information that day. He said, I'm gonna give you a call. I said, okay, thank you. Um, then he introduced me to the guys that were in the room who were all freaking out listening to me sing. And this as yet unnamed group um, had just gotten signed to Bad Boy. You now know them as 112. I met them as the four young men who didn't have a name yet um, in the session that day. So. Shout out to 112. You are very much so ingrained in the early stages of Kelly Price as a songwriter, producer, and solo career girl. <sighs> Love you guys. Okay, moving forward. Um, man, okay. So Puff, literally in my mind, I'm saying, okay, he said he's gonna call, he's not gonna call. 24 hours later, my beeper. Young kids, do not be disrespectful. 
I had a beeper back in the day when you literally spelt out words using the numbers upside down. Sometimes it was obscene. Sometimes it was, you know, but it was a beeper. It was a Motorola. It was a Motorola. Remember that? How do you write hello in the Motorola? Okay, I'm aging myself, but I told you how old I am anyway. Okay, so he texts me 24 hours later. I called him and he's like, hey, can you make it to the studio? I have a session. And I'm like, really? Yeah, I got a session. So I didn't ask any questions. I was like, what time do you need me there? He said, as soon as you can get there. I'm in Long Island at this point. Um, and he's in Manhattan. So I'm like, okay, I'll probably need about, it's the afternoon. So I'm like, I'll probably need about an hour and a half or so, but I can be there probably in about two hours. So I show up and I walk into a room and it's a session for Horace Brown. Now, a lot of you may not remember him. He was signed to Motown. Um, he had a couple of really big songs back in the 90s. That's the first session that I did. Shout out to Horace Brown. I want you, babe, and all that I do. And I believe Stevie J produced that song as well. First uh, session I ever did at Bad Boy at Daddy's house. And so um, shout out Horace Brown. Um, shout out to all the staff. Shout out to Felicia. I don't know where you are, my love, but if you see this or if somebody knows how to find her, she was Puffy's executive everything back then. Um, I would sure love to um, hear from you. Um, so Felicia was the one that used to, from that point on, God, I think I was in the studio every day from that point on for like the first 30 days. I was at daddy's house every day for like 30 days following that. And then just on and on and on and on and on. And um, he started to really put a lot of trust in me, um, running the sessions by myself, um, writing the songs, but then recording them on the artists who were coming in to record them. So I had the opportunity to write for so many people underneath the bad boy umbrella, every artist, at the label, most definitely. Um, and then, of course, the hitmen were there, so he wasn't just producing for himself. Um, Things We Do For Love, I See You, that was another incredible song by Horace Brown. Um, but for he was literally producing for everyone, everyone at that point. Um, so my, my, uh, my discography grew exponentially, working out of the bad boy, um, camp, just so many artists I got a chance to write for. Fast forward to the end of 1996. Um, I had just finished a writing session for Aaliyah and uh, I was leaving. I was headed home and Puff walks in the, the door at daddy's house and he says, uh, where are you going? I said, I'm done. I got everything done. Engineer has everything. I'm going to check out. And he's like, no, I need you to stay. And uh, I'm like, okay, what you got going on? He was like, Isley Brothers. Said, Isley Brothers, that's dope. He's like, I need you to write the song. I said, okay, <laughs> all right, when do you need it? He said, I need it now. He just got in the car, left the hotel, and they're on their way to the studio now. <laughs> I swear, he always put me in situations like that. Always, 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 always. But it drove me to be better. Um, and it made me, it made me um, understand, it, it taught me how to be grace under a different kind of fire. Um, growing up in New York City in a single parent home in the projects in Edgemill, that I had to learn grace under fire um, in a whole other way. But working with him taught me grace under fire, grace under pressure, um, and, and really having to show up and not let um, something be in the spur, spur of the moment um, disable your ability to show up and do the best job possible. So, um, yeah, that's how I met Ronald Isley. Co-writing Floating on Your Love with the guys from 112. Um, it was the first single from what people consider his comeback album, Mission to Please, having just signed over um, at Island Black through his own boutique label, um, T-Neck Records. And so me and the guys from 112 wrote Floating on Your Love for Ronald Isley, for the Ozzy Brothers featuring Ronald Isley. Um, I met Angela Winbush that day as well. Hello, Angela. She was there with him. Um, hey, Ronald, I love you, 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 love you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You changed my life. 
you changed the way I believe, believed in myself. You made me understand that God wouldn't give me a gift this powerful for it to be closeted, for it to be hidden in a corner in the dark, miked but unseen. Um, yeah, I'm not getting ready to cry on here with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald Isley. I appreciate you so much. Um, Angela Wimbus is a bad sister. Um, back when women were not even really being recognized as producers, she stood up and refused to not be recognized inside of a level of expertise that she absolutely had mastered. Um, producer extraordinaire. She wasn't just a writer, she was a producer. And so um, I honor you, Angela Wimbush. You are incredible. Thank you for your part in my story um, as an artist. Okay, so um, a lot of a lot of last minute challenges and, and me having to step up to the plate. So I wrote the song, Ronald Isley stops the session. Um, we, we finished writing the song, like right as he was pulling up. Thank you, Jesus, I say, um, for New York City traffic because it ended up taking him about an hour to get to the studio from his hotel right there in Midtown. And so um, we finished the song, 112 and I finished the song and I had enough time actually to go in and record <laughs> too, like the, the demo lead for uh, his vocal and then the guys from 112 and I did the backgrounds. Um, so he comes in and I'm like, okay, cool. So we're leaving and he's on his way in and Puff stops me again and he says, uh, where are you going? I'm like, we finished, I'm leaving, I'm going. He was like, no, you can't leave. Ronald Isley's here, you gotta stay for the session. And I'm like, well, I mean, do you need me to do something more? I laid up, we, me and the guys laid all the backgrounds. I sang a demo of the lead vocal. So he has a guide vocal so he can learn it, you know, from just from listening to it or whatever. So you're in good shape. And he said to me, no, I need you to stay and cut vocals on Ronald Isley. So I'm looking at him like, oh no. And this is the first time I actually told him, no, I said, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. He said, no, you have to do that. I said, no, I can't do that. That's Ronald Isley. You got to do it because it's Ronald Isley. He said, no, that's the reason why you got to do it. I, ain't, I He said, what I look like trying to tell Ronald Isley how to sing. And I looked at him. He said, you, I can't, he said, I can't do this, Kelly. You have to stay here. You have to do it. I need you to produce these vocals. And so I'm like, okay, Jesus, be with me. Um, needless to say, so I stayed. And that's how I ended up staying in the session. Uh, Ronald Isley stopped the session to ask me, like, what are you doing? What, like, what, it, what are you doing? What are they doing with you? Like, what, is, is somebody working with you? Are you putting out a record? And I said, oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not recording anything. I'm good. I'm a writer. Um, <laughs> I'm a writer. I'm a songwriter. I'm writing for everybody right now. I still tour with different artists. Um, you know, I'm moving into producing. And, and so, no, this is, this is what I do. And he was like, no, you should be making your own records. I'm like, yeah, they don't sign girls that look like me. And that's fine. Writing pays very, very well. I'm good. Like, I'm not tripping. Um, and he stopped and he said, no, you need to be singing your own songs. And I'm like, Mr. Isley, call me Ron. Mr. Isley. <laughs> Mr. Isley. Um, yeah, that ended up being a nine month debate because at the end of that session, we did exchange information. Um, he kept in touch. And he was scheduled, this is 1996, when the Olympics were in Atlanta. And he was doing opening night in Atlanta for the Olympics, like out there where everything was happening. So it was an outdoor concert. Um, and so he had been in rehearsal in uh, New York, New Jersey for weeks at that point. Called me the night before, um, probably like nine o'clock at night. And so I answered the phone and I'm like, Hey, Mr. Isley, I mean, Ronald, I mean, Mr. Isley. And he was like, Kelly, I need you, girl. <laughs> I was like, yes, sir. Um, he said, something happened at the last minute. I'm short one singer and I need you to come out with me to do this tour. And I'm like, okay, well, when do you leave? He said, in the morning. I'm like, I got toddlers. Ronald, I got toddlers, like I can't, I can't leave tomorrow. He said, we open the Olympics tomorrow, baby, I need you. 
we opened it and I'm like, ah, I can't. and I'm looking and I got toddlers. I have toddlers. Um, I ended up being on the plane. I was able to work it out. Um, yeah, I was on the plane the next morning, headed to Atlanta to uh, sing background for Ronald Isley and um, open up at the Olympics. Never having been in one rehearsal, his show was two and a half hours long, 24 songs, no rehearsal. I got into Atlanta in enough time to make the sound check with Ronald. So I sound checked with the band and with the singers and uh, <laughs> had to go and get dressed and come back in time for the show. So one thing I have to say about being uh, a church girl, about coming from a musical family filled with preachers and singers and uh, incredible musicians and, and songwriters. Um, and I have to just say, being a Church of God in Christ girl who from a very young age started working with Dr. Maddie Moss Clark. Shout out to the Clark sisters, I love you guys. I honor their mother. She, when I was very, very young, challenged me. She had heard me sing in New York at the, in the choir, the Eastern New York jurisdiction choir when Bishop Washington was still our presiding prelate. And uh, so when I showed up to UNAC one summer um, and she saw my mother in the choir, she asked her, where's your daughter at? I was in the youth choir rehearsal with Jackie Clark uh, Chisholm. Hey, Jackie. And uh, some of the other directors there. And uh, she told my mother, go get her. She, don't, she ain't supposed to be in that question. I need her here. I need her here in the alto section. So I got pulled from the youth choir uh, UNAC that year. And Dr. Clark insisted that I sang with the adults. And so um, I honor her because being underneath that kind of leadership, first of all, in my home church and in my house, um, Santiago de Chile, hey, um, starting in my house and in my family, being under that kind of pressure. My mother was the choir director at my grandfather's church. I didn't get to say no. If people decided they had an attitude on Sunday morning and did not want to sing, and that happened a lot, y'all old school, y'all know. Y'all know how I could be with the choir. People get an attitude, they don't wanna wear the robe because they got a new outfit, whatever the case may be, so they sit out on Sunday. Um, I can remember there were times when it was just my mother and my sisters and I, and we were the choir on Sunday morning. She, my mother ruled the choir with an iron fist. She did not play. She actually learned from the Dr. Maddie Moss Clark playbook, and she didn't play. She didn't do She didn't do uh, singers in the choir that felt like uh, they were so whatever that they were just going to come in and be whatever, and you were just going to take it because you need me in the choir. I literally remember the whole choir getting sat down one Sunday, and my mother and my sister and I were the choir. And she never had that issue again because I think people understood that if the three of us needed to be the choir, we could do it and we could do it very well. I just thought I'd throw that in there. So what I'm saying is, is that being under that kind of pressure is what prepared me for things like this to happen. Standing on the stage, only having made a sound check in 24 songs that I have never, ever performed before, not as a lead, not as a background, I stood on the stage um, and was smart enough to know that when we got to songs that I did not know or did not know enough of, because who didn't know like Ronald Isley's catalog, but it's live, it's different, there are arrangements and that kind of thing. So I stood there, I made sure that the, the microphone covered my mouth fully enough so that the audience to the front couldn't see the first time it went around that I wasn't singing. And so what I did was I stood in place, lesson to people who are trying to sing background, I stood in my place, I moved with Angela and the other young lady that was singing background and I'm in sync with them with my movements. I let the song go around one full time, verse, chorus. By the time he got to verse two, I was in there because it was locked in my head. That's how I performed 24 songs the first night um, on stage with Ronald Isley. That was night one. We took a long drive from Atlanta to Boston, Massachusetts for the second night. Strand Theater, I believe, is where we played. And uh, huh. he gets to the end of the show and he's going through his thing and he brings Angela out and she smashes, you know, she goes through, she sings Smile, she sings Angel, um, and just absolutely killed. 
So he breaks it down again. Anybody that's seen Ronald, like he breaks down, break it on down. And then that thick bass, break it on down. And so um, I'm like, okay, he's feeling it tonight. We're going, we going like an extra little something, something, something. Yeah, little did I know. So an extra little something, something, something turns into he starts singing. You abandoned me and love don't live here anymore. And then the next thing I know, he said, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet somebody. I'm still not getting what this moment is, y'all. I'm like dumb, okay? Um, come here, Kelly. Got big. Kelly, come here. <laughs> so I start walking. I'm like, Jesus, what is he doing? He introduces me to the audience in Boston that night. He says that he met me at daddy's house and that I've been writing. He started naming all these people that I had been writing for. Um, and he was like, her name is a name that you're going to hear <sighs> decades from now. You're going to know her name. She's going to be a household word. They're going to call her name in the same sentences with Gladys and Aretha and and patty and uh and he's he's saying all of this stuff and my heart is shaking my stomach is shaking and he starts singing love don't live here anymore again and so uh then he hands me the microphone and he says sing so i close my eyes i'm sorry i know i know better but i did the church move i closed my eyes <laughs> and i just let it go by the time I opened my eyes, there was not a person in their seat in the theater. Um, and the screams were so loud. I was so into what I was doing and trying to drown out so that I wouldn't let my nerves overtake me. Um, when I opened my eyes and everybody was on their feet. And in my mind, I'm just going, oh my God, what just happened? And he said, You'll be hearing from her very soon, everybody. This is my new artist, Kelly Price. Now, I just want you to know I had not signed a contract. We had not had this conversation again. He did not tell me he was gonna do it, <laughs> um, um, but he intended to do it. And he um, decided that he wasn't gonna give me an opportunity to say no, so he put me on the spot. And uh, I was introduced to Boston, Massachusetts as Ronald Isley's artist on Teaneck Records. And so, um, that was night number two, and that was 1996. And so I was on the road with him for nine months. We finished my deal while I was on the road with him. 1997, um, signed my deal with him. 1997, uh, he sealed the deal for me at Island Black with Hiram Hicks. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you, Hiram, who saw an opportunity to change the mindset of the music industry at Island Black and take it back to the music. Um, every artist that was signed at Island Black had to go through, it didn't matter how well-spoken you were. Everybody had to go through media training. Everybody had to work with the choreographer. God knows I'm not a dancer. I mean, it wasn't about making me dance. It was about making me comfortable in my skin um, on a stage and learning how uh, to, to own that space. So everybody had to work with a choreographer. Everybody had to, to go to media training. Everybody had to, we, we, it was a, it was like a clinic. He flew everybody to Atlanta and we had to stay there for like a week or so and do all of these different things. And so thank you, Hiram. Thank you guys for believing in me. Soul of a Woman was born from that. And I can just remember the closer we got to needing to get a release date, I finished the album pretty quickly, called a lot of favors in um, because I had been working on so many projects, uh, you know, from being out at, at daddy's house and that kind of thing. So I called a lot of favors. Y'all will never believe this, but I recorded that Soul of a Woman album with $200,000. I ended up with a million dollar video, shout out to Hype Williams because we, the single did so great they actually could justify spending that kind of money on my first video. Um, but I, I got that whole album done with $200,000. Can't tell me, let me tell you something. If you are a mother period, but if you a black mother and you ever had to learn how to make a dollar out of 15 cents, that's how I recorded that entire Soul of a Woman album with $200,000. 
because you got to be able to make a dollar out of 15 cents. And then it pays to um, have built relationships with people and shown up for them when they asked you to and not make everything about a dollar. If they need you, you go. And I had a lot of, lot of, um, a lot of relationships intact because when people had it, I was there, but if they didn't have it, I still showed up. Um, we had a different kind of working experience back then. We would all be in different sessions. And if we were all in the same building at the same time and somebody needed, uh, they couldn't figure out a part of a song and they needed us, you know, come help me write this song. I got this part and I can't quite hit it. Can you hear it? Can you come? Just can you come to my session for about 30 minutes and drop this for me? We had a lot of sessions that happened like that back then. And that's how so many of us ended up on each other's projects as well. We helped each other. It's always been competition, but I felt like it was friendly and it was healthy. The competition pushed us to be better versions of ourselves. We weren't necessarily competing with each other, but understanding that it is a charts game and it is a numbers game. Um, you brought it because you wanted one of those 10, 15 slots at radio to be yours. So you you did what you had to do. Um, so we, I feel like we were all, um, everybody, Faith, hey girl, Faith Evans, um, 112, everybody, total, hey ladies, I love you all. They were one of my earliest clients as far as being a writer um, and, and a vocal producer and a vocal coach. I have been quoted saying this and I've told the ladies this as well. They were my favorite clients. And I say that because when they walked into a session with me, it was never any egos, it was never any anything. They literally said, we will do whatever you tell us to do because we know that you're here because you wanna make us sound better. You want us to be better than what we are. You want us to be great. They were my favorite clients. I always enjoyed doing a total session. Um, yeah, um, always enjoyed, I'm trying to, still trying to read y'all. <laughs> Always enjoyed doing those sessions with Total. The story's getting long, but it's a 30 year old story. I'm gonna try and wrap it up because I gotta get back to work. Um, but, so that was, friend of mine was 1998. The single came out, you all know, you guys were hearing the song. You didn't have any pictures. We did not have a video. Um, and let me say this, we had photos, but we were intentional about waiting to get the response from radio and retail and and all of that and, and kind of get the feedback on the song and the song blew up and people loved it. And it's so crazy because nobody knew it was me. I could walk into a Kmart in Long Island back then and hear somebody singing, she was a friend of mine. And it would just freak me out because it was my song and they had no idea because I hadn't been on television. I hadn't done any of that. And we were very intentional about making sure that people fell in love with the song and with the voice. And then once they got a chance to see me, what you gonna say now? Cause y'all said a fat girl wouldn't appease too. And I'm saying y'all and I'm making a general statement. A fat girl wouldn't appease. A fat girl would not be aesthetically pleasing to the eye. A fat girl would not sell records because people wanna be able to fantasize um, when they're listening. And so I guess what we found out is that big girls um, can be a fantasy too. <laughs> um, but it really was about the music. It really was about the music. Um, we landed a number one with a friend of mine with no video. And then went and got hype and shot the epic remix and released the video and the song fell from number one prior to the release of the video. It was great music in the top 10. The Boy Is Mine was in top 10. John B, I believe, they don't know it was in the top 10. Um, that like, it was a great time to be in the top 10 on Billboard, right? So um, we released the video. The video goes out, it starts circulating. Um, the song goes back to number one, second time. So it went back to number one after the video came out. So. Not only did we prove it wrong, we broke a record. Twice at number one on the same song from the same project, first without a video. That was the record breaking move first and foremost. We did it without a video because people heard the song and it resonated with them and they were singing it. And some people were crying while they were singing it. A lot of y'all was cussing while y'all was singing it. I feel you, it came from all of that came from all of that. 
Um, and so my thank you now goes to you. And that's really what this live is about. Thank you. You said yes to Kelly Price. Thanks for tuning in to Nine Mag TV.